Hello, my name is Beth Feinberg, and I'm a member of the Hack This Experience team. Today, we're honored to be joined by Greg Baggs, who will speak about mental health and tech. And following Greg's talk, there will be a panel discussion in Q&A. Uh, please make sure to submit your questions for the Q&A through the Slido link in the chat. And I'm going to let Greg take it from here. Uh, thank you so much, Beth. Really appreciate it. I'm going to start my slides up here. And I'll just assume folks can uh, hear. And if you can't, please uh, uh, give me a shout and let me know or uh, hear and see. Uh, but uh, yeah, my name is Greg. Uh, I uh, serve on the developer evangelism team for a company called Twilio. Uh, I am calling into y'all from my basement in Brooklyn, New York. Uh, and I'm wearing my John Deere hat, uh, which I proudly acquired at Hack Illinois in 2015. Uh, I've had the, the privilege of uh, participating in, in many hackathons at uh, Illinois over the, the last few years. Actually, a funny story about this hat. When I first joined the developer evangelism team, uh, I asked my manager, I said, are there any examples of companies that, uh, that of non-technical companies that do great evangelism that go out and serve the community and, and try to get uh, their customers to evangelize their products to their communities? And he said, you know, John Deere is actually a company that has done a great job of that. They have great swag. They have their their customers often identify themselves by uh, you know the the brand of tractor that they use. Um, now I'm I grew up in Indianapolis uh, after the University of Illinois. I moved to Chicago. Now I'm in New York. I I don't know if I've ever actually been on a tractor in my life. Uh, but I came to Hack Illinois uh, and was able. I met a uh, developer evangelist actually from John Deere. John Deere had these amazing APIs. Uh, that they used to pull data out of their equipment and allowed developers to build awesome apps on top of it. And so I met one that gave some feedback on the API and I got a, a hat uh, at Hack Illinois. And it's my, uh, it's, it's my second favorite hat. I, I wear this hat quite often now. Uh, don't need to tell the story about the first favorite hat because it's just a long story. But uh, it, is, uh, it is such a privilege to be back. Um, you know, especially for me, I went to the University of Illinois um, in 2000 from, I'm sorry, I, I went from 1998 to 2003. Uh, and I recently discovered that I am uh, an alum of uh, University of Illinois, uh, which doesn't mean that I forgot I graduated. It means that I forgot, uh, or I actually, I, I never knew. I, I just recently, a couple years learned that alum just means you attended. It does not mean that you uh, graduated. Uh, which because I, I didn't graduate. And uh, unfortunately, it's not like one of those cool stories about, you know, I went for a year, I decided college wasn't for me, I left to start a startup. Uh, you know, it's, um, there's a lot of great uh, entrepreneurs that have come out of University of Illinois, a lot of great stories like that. Um, uh, that was not my story. I left after five years. I, uh, this is my transcript from uh, a lot of these classes were from my last year or two that I was there. You'll see a lot of uh, uh, D's and F's and what on here. I had a really, really rough time uh, at college. Um, and, uh, and, and a big part of the reason why I left uh, was because I was depressed. Um, but I didn't really know that word back then. Uh, and it certainly wasn't a word that I was comfortable using to describe myself. Um, and in retrospect, uh, of, let's see, probably about three years after uh, I left, I, I would come to be diagnosed with ADHD and type two bipolar um, and uh, would uh, you know, suffer from depression uh, for, for many years after I left. And um, it's what I'd like to do over the next you know, uh, 20 minutes or so is, is share uh, some of my story. Um, and then I wanna talk a little bit about why it seems like mental illness or just how the ways in which mental illness affects folks in the tech community. Um, and chat a little bit about what y'all can do about it if, if you feel like something like this might be affecting you. Uh, and then we're going to have uh, some other folks share a little bit about their stories and talk a little bit about some resources that are available on campuses to help folks who are struggling with these things. Um, so let me tell you a little bit. I mean, really, like my struggles with mental illness started um, probably about my uh, senior year, my fourth year in college. Um, and then really got bad during my fifth year, the, the victory lap, as folks like to call it. Uh, though, unfortunately, it, it you know, wasn't particularly victorious for me. I, I had just, uh, my fifth year, like broken up with my girlfriend, uh, my first girlfriend. Um, we, uh, I, most of my friends had graduated in four years uh, because they could do things like study. And for pretty much the entirety of my time at the University of Illinois, I couldn't study. I'd go to Granger, the engineering library, 
and I'd look at all these folks with like their heads down and like reading books and, and just sitting there paying attention. I'm like, how do they do that? I mean, that stuff felt impossible to me. It felt like every single semester I'd start and be like, this semester is going to be different. This semester, I'm going to keep a planner. I'm going to be organized. I'm going to go to all the classes. And that might last for two or three weeks. And then I just start sleeping late and I'd start just uh, not doing any work and cramming until the last minute, uh, you know, cramming the night before. Um, uh, I, my first few years were okay because I covered a lot of stuff in high school and the material was easy enough. I could figure it out, but uh, you know, the, <laughs> the classes get pretty hard and it turns out you cannot just learn linear algebra in a single night. Uh, I tried twice. Uh, I failed both times. Uh, and, and by the time I got to my fifth year, I was just so far behind and uh, most of my friends had graduated. I was kind of left behind. I was very alone. Uh, and then I uh, moved into this shitty, shitty apartment. Uh, for those of you who are watching who uh, are on Champaign or you know, who go to school in Champaign, uh, Urbana, this is uh, right at the corner of University and Fourth, uh, a few blocks from the engineering campus. It was my first time ever living alone. And um, I was failing out of school. I didn't know how to tell my parents that uh, you know, they, I, I, I grew up in Indianapolis, so I was paying out of state tuition. So my parents had spent a ton of money. I was going to leave without a degree. I didn't know how to tell them. Um, and I, I just got really depressed. And when I get depressed, the most obvious symptom is that I just sleep all day. Uh, and back then I was sleeping 12, 14 hours a day. Uh, you know, I had uh, a really hard time waking up before noon. Um, and, uh, I or basically would just not go to any classes. I would stay up real late, either playing video games, um, or programming uh, side projects that I would pretty much never launch. Um, and, and life just started this spiral and none of my friends knew about it. Uh, with the exception of one person, I, I had this friend, his name was Bill and, uh, Bill was someone I worked with, uh, at an off campus job. Um, and I hadn't been to work in a few weeks. He had sent me a couple emails just saying, hey, Greg, how are you doing? Uh, and I had ignored them. Uh, and then finally, one day, it's like a Thursday and it's probably like two o'clock in the afternoon or so. And uh, I'm sleeping uh, in my bed and uh, uh, Bill calls me and my phone rings and I, I see my rollover. I, you know, ignore the call. He calls again. I ignore it again. And then about two minutes later, I heard a knock on my door. And when you're forgetful, like I am, uh, there's like some life maintenance tasks that, uh, you know, you, you just accept that it's like easier to not do them. Uh, you know, so for me, like, for instance, locking my doors was one of those things. Uh, like I just, I never bothered locking my doors because I would always like forget my keys and lock the door behind me. And it just, it was way more likely that I was going to forget my keys than like someone was going to break into my house. And so I'm laying here in bed after ignoring a bunch of calls from Bill, I hear a knock at my door and I just panicked. And, uh, you know, at the time I, I was um, sleeping on this like cheap, um, you know, it was like a really thin mattress is on one of those metal bed frames that has the plastic casters on it. And we had hardwood floors and uh, the, the bed would, would roll around and the bed had rolled a, a couple feet away from the wall. And I heard my doorknob start to turn and I looked at that hole and I just very quietly slid into that hole between my bed and the wall. And I pulled the covers over me and I held my breath while Bill walked into my apartment and he poked his head into my bedroom uh, and then he poked his head into my office and then he left. Uh, that's, that's what shame feels like. I eventually failed out. Actually, that's not true. I, I thought I failed out. I, uh, for those of you at Illinois, there's a, a woman in the CS department named Heather Zyke, uh, who has been incredibly helpful uh, to me and, and who I and know many of you all are fans of. Uh, I had the privilege of speaking on campus last year. And before I did, she pulled my transcript and she said, hey, it looks like you're actually just two credits shy of uh, an econ degree. Um, and so at some point, COVID might be a good time to do this. Uh, I, I need to take two econ classes and I'll finally uh, graduate from the University of Illinois. But I've been walking around for uh, what, 17 years now thinking that I failed out of school. But uh, I failed most of the classes my last semester and then I never went back. Um, and you know, I, I thought maybe the problem was just school. Like I, I thought maybe the problem was just the environment and 
that things would be better uh, if I didn't have to study and whatnot. And so I moved back home to my parents in Indianapolis. I started doing uh, freelance web development. I had programmed most of my life. I started programming when I was a kid, uh, really enjoyed it. And this was like 2003. So, you know, the web stuff was, was really uh, quite popular. And uh, I was doing freelance web development and I was just hitting all the same problems. You know, even though I was good at doing the work, uh, I wouldn't start on it until the night before I was supposed to have a call with a customer. I mean, I would just sit at my computer, just, just waiting, like just trying, forcing myself to like do something. And I just couldn't get started on stuff. And, and this happened for like a year. I get to a point where I'm hiding from the customer and then the customer starts calling my parents' house. And so I start staying out late, waiting for them to go to bed. Cause I don't want to, I'm hiding from them. And I just didn't know how, like why this was happening. And the only excuse I had was that I was just a lazy bastard. You know, I knew that I had a lot of privileges here. Uh, I knew that I was incredibly fortunate to have these opportunities and, and I was just wasting them. I was sleeping all day. I was playing video games, watching TV, and I just was not doing my work. And I just felt like I was a lazy bastard. And there's this verse in the Bible that says, I do not understand what I do for what I want to do. I don't do, but that which I hate, I do. And I hated what I was doing. And so, uh, Finally, one night, about a year or so after I, I left school, just in desperation, I just, I went to that place that you go when you have questions about life that have no answers. And I Googled it. And I just, I just Googled chronic procrastination. I, I didn't know how else to describe what was happening to me. And it wasn't long before I was reading about ADHD or you know, attention deficit hyperactivity disorder. I just say ADD normally. Um, and uh, you know, I started reading these stories that just sound really familiar. And I ended up going to Barnes and Noble and getting this book called Driven to Distraction. And I'm reading this book. I read the whole thing in like a day and I'm just reading story after story of people. It's like, I, I wanna like simultaneously like jump for joy because I feel like I'm not alone but I also just kind of wanted to cry because I'm seeing all these stories of pain that remind me so much of just how I felt about myself and my life. And it still took me a year and a half after reading this book, reading a couple other books and basically self-diagnosing as ADHD to see a therapist. Like I really did have this belief that I just needed to stop being lazy. I needed to try harder. I needed to uh, just snap out of it, you know? Um, but finally, uh, at, yeah, I ended up moving to Chicago after struggling with a lot of the same behavioral patterns for a while. I, I ended up going to see this woman named Lori Walsh. She was a therapist. I take some tests. Uh, then it was like some questionnaires and uh, I had to fill out like some questionnaires and then have people I worked with or, or family members fill these things out. Uh, and then I, you know, come back for a follow-up appointment a couple weeks later and I go in and I, I meet with her and, and she says, um, you definitely have ADD. Uh, she's like, you are off the charts. And I was like, yes, <laughs> it was like, I'm like, I'm like the overachiever of the underachievers, I guess. Um, you know, for, for me, like once I found that diagnosis of ADD, it, it offered, um, not an excuse, but a reason. You know, like a lot of these stories of ADD, I found uh, they would describe both the, the, my weaknesses, but also my strengths. I mean, there's a lot of things, there's a lot of situations that I'm actually like abnormally good at. And a lot of these books I read said, you know, people who have ADD, their brains actually focus really well in the right environment, like in high pressure situations, you know, and, and right before the test or in like crisis situations. Uh, it's, you know, the other times it's the kind of the mundane, the trivial stuff where the brains are, are just kind of always looking for stimulation. If they don't find it, then it, it's, you know, it's has a hard time focusing on boring stuff basically. Um, but under the right circumstances with the right tasks, with the right projects, you can really excel. Uh, and so ADD both explained my weaknesses, but also kind of my strengths, sort of my superpowers. And I found that really encouraging. Uh, and so when Lori said, you definitely have ADD, that was great for me because the other thing it also gave me was a reason that was other than me just being a moral failure. Uh, it, it wasn't just me being a lazy bastard. But she said, but I think you might also have type two bipolar. And there I was like, no, uh, I, I will take the ADD and you can keep the bipolar. 
that's, uh, that's what crazy people have. And, you know, I didn't know anything about bipolar at the time. Uh, so this is, <laughs> this is, this is the chart I, I drew earlier to describe this, uh, you know, type one bipolar, uh, is also called manic depression. Uh, highs are called mania. The lows are, are depression. Uh, there's many different forms. Uh, one form is called rapid cycling. Someone can go through the, the highs and the lows in a single day. Uh, my bipolar type two bipolar, the, the cycles are more elongated. The highs are not as high. So instead of full blown mania, you have what's called hypomania. Um, and, and the depression, uh, at least in my case, wasn't as bad as, as what many folks have suffered with. Uh, and for me, what it would feel like typically is like four to six weeks of being depressed. And then I'd have a few days here and there for some reason, uh, I just get a boost of energy. I'd, I'd speak really fast. I get all these creative ideas. I, I'd be filled with optimism. I wouldn't sleep much. Uh, I'd be super productive, super creative for a few days. And then I just drop back down in depression where, you know, life just felt like walking through a swimming pool. And so, you know, after I basically was in denial about the bipolar thing for a couple of years, I started taking meds for ADD. They really did help me focus, but they also caused panic attacks. They would help me, you know, they basically caused me to like focus on being depressed when I got depressed, which was often. Uh, and so on the one hand, I, I could actually make lists and follow the lists, um, but they also just, I think, made my mood a lot more severe. And I just continued going through those same cycles, those ups and downs. And you know, I, I didn't want to admit that I had bipolar. I certainly didn't want to take meds for bipolar, which was weird. You know, like I was so reluctant to taking meds, but at that time in my life, like I was 25, I was smoking half a pack of cigarettes every day. I was, um, uh, I, I was drinking, you know, on the weekends, at least getting drunk two or three times a week. I was basically smoking weed every day. Uh, but I was like, no, nah, I don't want any like chemicals messing with my brain. You know, and, uh, and there was just a stigma about like, <laughs> like taking the meds. And, and, and so even though the, the Adderall helped, uh, I, I was really, re in some ways, uh, heard in other ways, I was really reluctant to, to accept the bipolar diagnosis. Uh, I ended up getting this job in Chicago with this guy named Josh Golden. And uh, it was really a dream job. I was working for this company called Table XI uh, and as a web consultancy. And what I really just found out was the same pattern kept repeating. Like I would start off so strong. And then basically after about nine months there, I was dropping the ball on every project. And uh, finally things came to a head when I had this project that I'd been working on um, for, I'd been basically at the office till like 2 a.m. every night, just trying to get started on it. Not even trying to finish, just trying to start. And I hadn't been able to make any progress. And finally, like on Friday, you know, I had left the office like three in the morning, gone home, gone to bed, promised myself I would like get up early, work on this thing, overslept my alarm like I did every other day in my life. And, um, and Josh lived just a couple doors down from me. He's the owner of the company. We had become good friends and uh, he lived like a block away. And so he had tried getting a hold of me and he couldn't reach me. So he walks down to my house, knocks on my door. I'm in bed and I still don't lock my doors. And so for the second time in my life, I had a coworker uh, walking to my door in the afternoon because he hadn't seen me at work in a while and asked how I was doing. And this time I just couldn't hide from it anymore. You know, I, I think like the deal I had made with myself was even though I don't know how to control what's happening, I'm just going to contain the damage. I'm gonna isolate all the fallout to myself, make sure no one else gets hurt. And what I finally had to realize was that it doesn't work that way. Like if you are going through a mental health crisis, the people around you are going through that with you, whether they know what's going on or not. Like your friends, your family members, your coworkers, they are impacted by your mental health. I set up an appointment with a psychiatrist later on that day. Uh, I went to see him. Uh, he said, you know, I, I saw him and I told my story. He said, you know, it, it, type two bipolar sounds like what you have. He said, you're actually, you know, really fortunate. Um, we, uh, we have these meds, they're called Lamotrigine. Um, uh, they work really well. Uh, there's basically no side effects. Uh, well, he said, actually, no, that's not true. There is one side effect. Uh, a very small number of people who take Lamotrigine uh, end up getting a life-threatening rash in their anus. Uh, and, and when he said that, I, I was like, 
Uh, I actually said to him, I said, uh, you know, I'm pretty sure if I get a life-threatening rash inside my anus, I'm still going to be depressed. Um, but you know, fortunately, I, I started taking them uh, in uh, 2010. Um, and I've been taking them uh, ever. No, I started taking them in 2008. I've, and I've been taking them ever since. Um, and uh, no rash, thankfully. Uh, every time I get an itch, I, I worry a little bit. But it is, it's so far so good. Uh, and I have just been incredibly fortunate. Um, basically everything after having bipolar has been a best case scenario for me. I, I had incredibly supportive parents who understood when I finally came clean and told them I didn't graduate. Um, I, my meds worked the, the first time. Um, I didn't have to switch. There's very low side effects. Um, uh, I met my wife, uh, Rachel, uh, basically the day that I set up that appointment with a psychiatrist and she came alongside me and uh, really just helped pull me out of a hole as, as the meds uh, started to, to work. Most folks who struggle with mental illness are, are not nearly as, as fortunate uh, as my situation has been. Uh, the, the National Association of Mental Illness uh, estimates that about 44 million adults experience mental illness in any year, uh, which is about one in five. Um, and one in 25 live with a serious mental illness. And uh, for instance, 1% uh, has schizophrenia, about two and a half percent of the population or 6 million folks uh, live with uh, some form of bipolar, 7% uh, of adults uh, live with major depression. Uh, almost uh, 20, 18% of folks uh, have anxiety, um, which, you know, it's so incredible that these numbers are actually so much larger than for illnesses that we hear about all the time, you know, uh, and in fact, for a condition like bipolar, uh, almost 20% of people who have bipolar will die from it, in part because um, one in three people who have bipolar will attempt suicide uh, at some point uh, in their life. It actually, bipolar has a higher mortality rate than some forms of cancer. So, why am I at a, a computer science event uh, talking about this stuff? Um, I'm just, I'm going to run through a few, like, these are cherry picked symptoms of ADHD and bipolar. Uh, I picked these for effect. I'm not an, a doctor. The only thing I'm really an expert on is, is my personal story. But these are some of the things that I've, I've uh, struggled with uh, and symptoms of, of my condition. Um, so first off, hyper-focusing, which I'm sure most of y'all know what that is. Uh, it's, you know, it's hard to get started. Once you do, uh, you can just lock in on it uh, and you might just forget that, uh, you know, the world exists. Uh, racing thoughts is what it sounds like. Pressured speech is when the racing thoughts try to escape through the small hole in your mouth. Uh, there's irregular sleep patterns, especially onset insomnia. It's hard to fall asleep at night and impossible to wake up in the morning. Uh, there's social isolation, uh, uh, often because of the associated anxiety. Uh, there's thoughts of grandiosity. There's, uh, you know, thinking that the rules don't apply to you, thinking that maybe you can solve problems that no one else has solved, thinking that, you know, maybe you can change the world or something. Um, if you're a young adult or, uh, you know, an adolescent and you're experiencing these symptoms, finding the tech world might feel a little bit like coming home to you. You know, we, we accept the socially isolated. We will tolerate inconsistent bursts of productivity. And, you know, thoughts of grandiosity, you know, we, I don't know if I, I'm not going to play the video here because playing YouTube videos over Zoom never really results in a very great experience. But if you haven't seen this commercial, it's a pretty legendary commercial from Apple. Here's the crazy ones. And the quote in there is, here's the crazy ones, because while the rest of the world sees crazy, we see genius. Because the ones who believe that they can change the world are the ones who do. We have been asking the world to send us the crazy ones, right? We've been looking for the geniuses. Like the tech community is perhaps the most uh, uh, comfortable, professional community for folks who are struggling with mental illness today. Um, and in fact, there is a number of stories of folks uh, in the history of computer science who have suffered greatly from mental illnesses. You know, the gentleman considered to be the grandfather of computer science, Alan Turing, committed suicide uh, after facing years of prosecution from his government for being gay. And about eight years ago, we lost a gentleman named Aaron Schwartz, who was a pretty famous hacker based out of New York, and I want to read 
um, uh, something that Aaron wrote uh, back in 2007. He said, I have a lot of illness. I don't talk about it for a variety of reasons. I feel ashamed to have an illness. It sounds absurd, but there's still enormous stigma around being sick. I don't want to use being ill as an excuse, although sometimes I wonder how much more productive I'd be if I wasn't so sick. Surely there have been times when you've been sad. Perhaps a loved one has abandoned you or a plan has gone horribly awry. Your face falls, perhaps you cry. Everything you think about seems bleak. The things you've done, the things you hope to do, the people around you. You want to lie in bed and keep the lights off. Jabra's mood is like that, only it doesn't come for any reason and it doesn't go for any either. Go outside and get some fresh air or cuddle with a loved one and you don't feel any better, just more upset at being unable to feel the joy that everyone else seems to feel. Everything gets colored by the sadness. Depression affects one in six, yet sadly it is not seen as real enough to deserve the investment and awareness of conditions like breast cancer, which affects one in eight, or AIDS, which affects one in 150. And there is, of course, the shame. The shame is what's killing us. Like, we, we actually have like pretty good treatments for mental illness. They're not great. They're not, they're, I mean, they're not cures, right? But like so many folks have been helped by therapy. So many folks have been helped by medicine. But the reason why folks don't get to those treatments is because of the stigma. The reason we don't talk about it is because of the stigma. My friend Rob here, I saw him at a conference last year. He was there with his crutch. He had fallen down and hurt his leg, but he didn't feel embarrassed that he needed a crutch. No one like, no one said, hey, aren't you afraid you're using that padded pole as a crutch? Like he needed that, that crutch so that he could do his job and work as a videographer at this conference I was at. But so many folks who are taking uh, meds so that they can do their work, so that they can go out, leave their house, live their lives, are accused by their friends of using it as a crutch. And I think that anyone who actually uses has used a crutch before can tell you is actually really hard to use a crutch. Like it's easier just to stay in bed. It's easier to just stay on the couch and watch TV. And similarly, it requires an incredible amount of courage and strength to go see a therapist, to go see a psychiatrist. This is my guy. This is Mark Dollar. He's my psychiatrist here uh, in New York. Uh, he's who I get my meds from. I, to this day, continue to take uh, stimulants for ADHD and Lamictal for type two bipolar. Uh, and I admit there are times when I am tempted to put on my calendar instead of just saying uh, therapist or psychiatrist to just say, you know, doctor's appointment, you know, sometimes I'm embarrassed. Even though I talk with people, sometimes I'm embarrassed. And I don't, I don't understand why we have that in, in our, actually I have an idea, but uh, I, I think part of the problem is, is because so many of y'all who are watching this now are so used to finding identity in how well your brain works. You know, if you're at University of Illinois, if you're participating at Hackathon, chances are you've often been praised for being smart. And it can be terrifying to have to go see someone because you don't think your brain's working quite right. Uh, last year, I got had the privilege of going to uh, see the uh, going to the U.S. Open, and um, the second day of the tournament, uh, we were watching the practice courts, and Serena Williams came out, and Serena the night before had played in Arthur Ashe Stadium. There was 25,000 people in the stadium. She won her match in under an hour. And then the next morning at 10 a.m., she was right there out on the practice court. And this guy in the, the white shirt next off to her right is her coach. Serena Williams, the greatest of all time. She has a coach. She recognizes that there's ways she could improve. And unless you're as good at managing your emotions as Serena is at playing tennis, chances are you would also benefit from seeing a therapist or seeing a psychiatrist. Um, there it is, there's very few moments in my life I can point to and say, that's the day when my life changed, when the trajectory of my life changed for the better. But the first time I saw a therapist is one of them. The first time I saw a psychiatrist is another. Uh, this can be difficult. Uh, I know there's a lot of folks on here from University of Illinois. I know the world is weird right now with COVID. Um, uh, University of Illinois does have uh, counseling available to you. I presume that some form of that is available online. It's actually perhaps never been easier to see a therapist than it is today because everyone has had to move online. Uh, and I see a therapist every other week on Zoom. It's not the best experience. I, I do enjoy being in the room better, but it, it significantly reduces the friction to seeing someone. 
Um, so I'm going to wrap up here and then we're going to uh, chat with uh, so, some other uh, you know, peers of yours. Um, but I do just want to encourage anyone here who's listening, basically two things. If any of this stuff has resonated with you, if, if you're still listening, you know, now 30 minutes into this thing, um, first off, I just encourage you, see a professional. Just talk to someone about it. If you, if you can't see a professional, find a friend, find a professor, find a, a family member, and just say, you're struggling. And I can tell you, just, just put, putting those words out there often will stop the spiral. There's, there's still going to be other work that you will need to do. And, and that, that work may involve getting medical treatment for stuff, uh, but that you don't have to. Like, you can, like, seeing a therapist is a wonderful first step, but often just talking to someone will stop the spiral. The second thing I just want to encourage you all, if you really are in the depths of it right now, um, if it seems like maybe things will never get better, I just want to encourage y'all to keep hope. My last year at school, you know, I was failing all these classes. I had a lot of nights when I went to bed and I was just praying that God wouldn't wake me up. I, thankfully, I, I never really, I, I never became suicidal. Um, but I can tell you that I had a lot of days when I just didn't want to live anymore. When I kind of like hoped that I would die. I thought for sure since I had, you know, for me, I thought I had failed out of school that I would be unemployable. Uh, I thought that because school, I was a failure at school that I would be a failure at most things if not everything I did in life. Um, I, I, I love my job so much and, and I, I have, um, I'll just I'll share that it's a little weird thing to share, but a, a couple years ago, uh, I had the privilege of ringing the, uh, well, I, I, I didn't actually get to press the button and ring the bell. I got to stand behind Jeff, uh, our CEO, when he rang the bell at the, the New York Stock Exchange to open. Um, uh, we, uh, this was not at our IPO. We were invited back a couple years after the IPO um, and uh, to ring the opening bell. And uh, Twilio basically sent, at the time, there was about 1,500 folks working for the company. We have about 3,300 today. Uh, and they picked 10 high performers uh, to go represent the company to stand next to Jeff as he rung the bell. And, and I was one of the ones who got picked. And I never would have imagined with all those classes that I was failing that one day I'd be able to have a career like this. You know, back when I was living in that shitty apartment and I had blown off all my friends and, and I disappointed so many people, I thought no one would ever be able to depend on me again. And I have the privilege today of being the dad to a amazing five and a half year old girl. Uh, and my wife has, uh, is pregnant with our second kid. And I cannot tell you the absolute joys um, of being a parent of living in New York um, of working for this company. They are things I could not have imagined when I was back at Illinois. Uh, I, I, I could not have imagined things getting better. So for anyone who's in the midst of it right now, I just encourage you that things can get better. And the first step on the path to things getting better is to talk to someone about it. So thank you all very much for listening. Uh, if anyone wants to chat with me, you can email me here, and I believe we're going to hand it off to some other folks here to uh, share a little bit. Thank you so much, Greg. That was really powerful. Um, now we're going to begin our panel discussion. Would uh, Rishabh like to begin by introducing himself and sharing his story? Sure. Um... Thank you so much, uh, Greg, for that. Actually, I didn't realize this, but I think I um, attended your talk last year at school. Um, I realized kind of why we were talking. Um, but yeah, that was just a funny story. But uh, my name is Rishabh. Uh, I'm going to be a junior studying math and computer science. Um, uh, and uh, when I was 16, uh, I was told by my therapist that I I'm autistic and that I have um, anxiety disorder. I, I, I say told, not diagnosed, because um, she's a therapist, not a psychiatrist, so I don't feel comfortable using the word diagnosed. Um, but yeah, and all, all that really means is that um, it's harder for me to understand social cues. And uh, I like sometimes have sort of 
uh, ticks. So when I'm anxious, for example, I'll cross uh, a lot of the times, things like that. Um, yeah, that's, that's all it really means. But um, I guess a story about myself and that if I'm going off topic, uh, feel free to stop me. But um, uh, when I came to school, so I grew up in India. Um, I did from when I was six to when I was 17. Um, and I came to Illinois to study. And during my first winter, so that would have been like fall 2018 to spring 2019, I was basically a sloth. I, um, I would not leave my bed unless I had to go to the bathroom or to drink water. I um, would sleep for like 16 hours a day. Um, I would shower maybe like once a week. Uh, I would eat like every once every two days. Um, it was really like really terrible. Um, and I was also like, I guess um, my ticks were like going really off the charts. I would take every like two minutes pretty much. Um, and it got to the point where I was like, and I felt really lonely. Uh, I got, it got bad enough that I like looked how I would be able to get a gun license uh, where the closest gun store was. Um, really, really bad essentially. Uh, and then one day uh, I managed to get out of bed and my roommate and some of our friends, we were going to like McDonald's and I, um, I like the second we were gonna enter into the McDonald's, I just like panicked, I ran away. Um, my, my roommate didn't know what the hell was happening. Uh, I was just, I just ran and I, I think like, I don't remember where I went, um, but I came home and I, I had an email from my roommate. Um, and it was, it was like, it was very heartfelt and all it, essentially it was like, it was very long, but essentially all it said was that he was like there for me um, and he, uh, would like yeah he was there to talk and um it I wouldn't say it was the turning point but it was definitely a very big step I actually it's a very meaningful note to me I, I keep it pinned up on my wall um but after that I like reached out to my therapist that I had in, back home in Bangalore uh I went to the counseling center I couldn't afford psychiatry unfortunately it was like two hundred dollars so I couldn't get like medication or a full diagnosis still, but I like started going to group art therapy. Um, I like, uh, I go to my, I see my therapist in Bangalore. Um, and I wouldn't say I'm, I'm cured by any means, but like I said, autism essentially means that social situations are pretty hard for me. But recently actually I was appointed like the social chair for reflection of projections, another, another um, organization at our school. So I, I'd say I'm, I'm making progress, I guess. And um, yeah, I really don't know, uh, I guess what I'm supposed to say. That was just like a story from my life. Um, that's all I have, I guess. But, Thank yeah. you so much, Rishab. Uh, would Melissa like to go next? Sure, um, actually, I think Ananya was going to go next, if that's all right. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks, Melissa. Uh, hey, so I'm Ananya, um, and I'm, I guess my story started a little similarly where, um, you know, I'm mental health illness is something that I've dealt with for most of my life, but growing up in an Indian American household, it was such a taboo topic. You couldn't talk about it. I couldn't ask my parents for help. I couldn't really reach out to anyone. And so I think things started to get really bad for me once I came to college, and I started sort of what Greg was talking about, struggling with sleep, struggling with doing basic things, getting out of the house, blowing off friends, that kind of thing. Um, and then, you know, my junior year, things just started spiraling. And I was in the hospital again and again and again. I started failing my classes. Um, and then it wasn't until this one day where I was actually in the ER on a ventilator. And my, my parents called because they found out from the university that I had essentially been kicked out of school. Um, and that was a real wake up call for me when I realized that something had to change. Uh, and I eventually found out that I was diagnosed with bipolar two. Um, and so I took some time off from school around two years, and I never ever thought that I would be able to come back. But as some of you might know, um, I just finished my junior year, which is an incredible time, and I've been able to come back and really reconnect with everyone. And everyone has been incredibly supportive, including my family now. And um, I was really lucky to speak at TEDx UIUC about my story and work with a lot of the people here on the CS Mental Health Committee starting that last spring. 
And it's been a really crazy journey, but I'm so, so glad that I took the time to work on myself and to get the help that I needed. Um, because yeah, like Greg was talking about, I think it would have just been the same story over and over again. And so I really wanna echo what he said about finding a therapist, getting on medication, checking out all those avenues that you need to, even if they're difficult. And if it doesn't work out the first time, that's okay. For me, it took many therapists till I found someone who was a good fit or different medications. And that's completely okay, but don't ever be afraid to reach out because you'll be surprised how many people are here to support you and I'm so grateful that I have the CS Mental Health Committee. I'm so grateful that I've been able to work on mental health policies and engineering on campus and met amazing people on this call and otherwise. And so, yeah, plus one to, to speaking out. Thank you so much, Ananya. Melissa, would you like to go now? Yeah, sure. happy to. Um, my name is Melissa and I'm a rising junior studying computer science. I'm um, also the events chair for CS Mental Health Committee. Um, so my story is a little bit weird. Um, I guess the way to put it is that I have pretty bad anxiety. It doesn't always manifest in ways that people think that they're going to see, um, but it is pretty bad for me. Um, like sometimes I just have trouble like focusing or like my thoughts just keep spiraling or like I see like the worst case scenario and anything that could ever happen. And um, that's just a little bit about me, I guess, but more importantly, like it started manifesting in ways that like I didn't think it was going to. Um, so when I came to college, like it kind of just kept going and getting worse and worse and worse um, to kind of just stop the anxious thoughts from keeping on coming. I made myself very, very busy. Um, got involved in pretty much anything that I could because my logic was if I took up all the time that I had in the world, then I wouldn't have any time to think. And if I didn't have any time to think, then I wouldn't have any time to have anxious thoughts. Um, and that honestly just made things a lot. Um, and it took a lot of time and a lot of convincing and a lot of support from people for me to realize that going into that and going into that spiral was really not the way to be solving my problems. And so one of the things that I really want to make sure um, is that it's okay to be talking about your mental health issues and it's okay to be talking about mental health, mental health and mental illness um, because the more that we make it normal to talk about, um, the more people that will reach out and to be able to see other people um, dealing with these things, be able to support them and be able to like just become a better community as a whole. And I feel like as everybody else has mentioned before, it's kind of a thing that you just don't talk about. Um, and so I just really hope that one day we will be able to talk about this much more in the open and to be able to help each other out more. Thank you so much, Melissa. Uh, Shagun, would you be able to go next? Yeah, definitely. Um, well, first of all, I want to thank everybody for sharing their stories um, and being vulnerable with us. Um, so my story kind of started in high school. So just to introduce myself, I'm going to be a sophomore studying computer science and statistics at U of I. Um, so I, my story kind of started in high school. Um, and at the time, looking back, I really didn't realize like what I was going through. Um, my self-esteem, I would say around like sophomore year of high school was like the worst it had ever been. Um, I felt so lonely, so um, just like empty all the time. And I didn't recognize what was going on. Um, after talking to like my mom about it, I think like Ananya mentioned, like there's kind of a stigma in Indian American families. Um, and um, after talking to her about it, I just kind of realized, okay, maybe it's just something that like teenagers go through, you know, like just me being a teenager. Um, so I kind of just did my own self-help kind of things, read some books, um, did some Googling and like tried to help myself, which I feel like did help me and it got me through that time. Um, but I definitely needed more. And there were probably, a, I remember there were a lot of things going on in my life at that time, which like really worsened it. But I would say it became very bad my senior year of high school. Um, I was going through some like personal things with um, school and like family and friends and stuff like that. And I think like some of it was heightened by like how I was feeling um, and everything just felt 10 times more worse than like it, 
probably actually was. Um, and I don't want to like discredit the way I was feeling, but um, I just didn't know how to deal with it. I remember like I was sitting in the library one day just studying for an exam. Um, and all of a sudden I just like broke down to my friend um, and just started telling her how I felt. And um, thankfully I had some really close friends who who like encouraged me to go talk to somebody, which then I went to my dad who like also had struggled with anxiety and depression. Um, and actually that was the first time that I found out that he previously did, which I feel like I might've gotten help earlier if, um, if I knew that earlier. Um, but even then I was, he like offered to help me get help. Um, but even then, I don't know why I was so afraid to, and it was probably the stigma around, like, like Greg mentioned, like not feeling like it's okay for your mind to not be working. I, I was one of those kids where people like that I knew would be um, praising me for um, various things that were going on in my life. And I didn't want to accept that something like was wrong with me, especially having to do with my brain. Um, so then I came to college and all of a sudden I was alone without like my closest friends. Um, I was meeting a ton of different people, just trying to create like connections, um, different environment. And all of a sudden I was in two CS classes where my workload was just like extremely heavy. And um, this was completely different for me. I like kind of drowned myself in work, was always working. Um, and then I think around end of September, maybe early October of 2019, actually Greg came and spoke for CS100. Um, and I was listening to his talk and I don't think I've ever told you this, Greg, but um, I, I, I like kind of identified with almost everything he was saying. And I did go up to him afterwards and I was like, um, I, really connected with what you told me and you have like now encouraged me to actually go and do something about it. So I remember like immediately after that talk, I called up my dad and I was in tears. And this was like probably the lowest point that I ever had. Um, uh, yeah, I was like in tears. I was telling him like everything that had been going on for the past month and a half or so. Um, and after that, we finally went to, he, he helped me find some, find a therapist and I finally, um, got some help. So it was, uh, almost a shameful journey. At least that's what it felt like in the moment But looking back at it. Um, I feel like I should have not have, I, I could have, um, I don't know how to describe this. I'm so sorry, <laughs> but, um. I could have gotten help earlier if I didn't have that stigma in my mind, which I, I'm like so glad that we have the CS Mental Health Committee and like people like Greg's talking about it more. Um, but yeah, that's basically my story. And yeah, thank you for giving me a space to share this. Thank you so much, Shagun. Um, could Rishan please go next? Hello, hi. Um... Well, my name is Rishan and I'm a rising sophomore at UAUC. And I'm actually one of the co-directors of Hack Illinois and of this event, Hack This. So hello, thank you all for coming. Um, for me personally, uh, my mental health struggles probably go all the way back to like sixth grade. Um, and it took the form of me just feeling worthless and by extension, feeling like I was a burden on those around me. I was a burden on my friends and a burden on my family. and I struggle to describe exactly why I feel that way, probably because it isn't rational to ever feel that way. Um, just looking back, it seems so silly, but I just had expectations for myself. I expected to be able to work and then understand the material. And I expected to understand the material and thus perform well. And I just wasn't doing those things. I just wasn't meeting those expectations. So for me, my conclusion was the only thing that could be at fault is me. I, as a person, was incapable, and I, as a person, just wouldn't amount to anything. I just felt like I was a shitty investment that my parents made, and I was just here hemorrhaging cash. And that last part was actually, like, literally, at some point in my early high school career, I remember sitting down and writing what I can only describe as, like, a note, writing down everything about myself 
that was a burden to others. And that included my medical expenses and included how much I transfer paying for my doctor's visits, for the medicines I take. And like being the same kid I am, I even remember writing down the carbon emissions I exuded just by existing. And I laugh about that now because it honestly is so silly. But back then I legitimately believed that I wasn't worth the carbon emissions it took for me to drive to school. And after writing all of those cons, I couldn't write a pro, not one pro. Um, I was just in that mentality. Um, and that's when it began. I would tell myself I didn't deserve food or water that day. Um, I would read the side effects of the medicines I was taking and I'd fantasize. Um, I was reckless and I didn't care about hurting myself and I didn't care about that ending up with me dead. But I'm thankful that at that point in my life is where that spiral stopped. I was just so incredibly lucky to find an incredible support group later in high school. Um, and it's not like I talked to them about my issues because that was, still is very hard for me. Um, but just by them being present and making me feel loved and valued, that was enough for me to show that my thoughts back then were irrational. Um, and they are supposed to be irrational because they are a product of an illness, a mental illness, where you react to something in a way that you aren't supposed to. And yeah, I, it still happens today. I still have doubts of my self-worth, definitely not to that extent. Um, but I probably still don't have like the healthiest coping mechanisms. I'm still not great at being vulnerable. Um, I still don't talk to others how I feel. Um, in fact, this right here is my first time probably publicly ever saying anything about this. And it's the first time a large majority of my friends will ever hear about this. Um, and yeah, I think that's probably a big reason why it's such a relief to finally go to a therapist early this year. Just for second, I want to thank Greg personally. Um, the talk he gave in CS100 is what inspired me to do so. Um, because my personal struggle is always feeling like I'm a burden. Um, so I also like talking to my friends was an option to me, but therapists were obviously like an option. And I'm by no means end goal. As I said, I still struggle talking about my own mental health um, and how I'm feeling. Um, but I do consider myself a success story in taking that first step because that first step means so much. It'll get you out of the way you're feeling today. So if there's that one takeaway I want you all to have is to please have hope. Um, I know you aren't feeling great, but I want to promise you that you will feel better. There will come a time where you feel loved and you will love yourself. Um, and in the meantime, the best thing you can do is to please talk about it. Um, and if you feel, if you're like me and you just don't want to talk about it to your friends or your family, um, we have other like resources where you can talk to other people. Um, I've gone to three therapy sessions myself at UIUC's counseling center. Um, I'm currently working on building up the courage to ask my parents about regular therapy. Still not there yet, but I'm getting there and I'm recognizing my progress and I'm okay with that. Every step is a step in the right direction. Um, but for now, please talk to anybody you can. Um, actually, like if you don't feel comfortable talking to your friends or um, your family, we definitely have resources where you can talk to strangers. But if you want to talk to a peer, um, I'd be happy to just put my phone number in the chat after this. Feel free to text me um, if you just want an ear um, to listen to what you're feeling or some advice. Um, but yeah, I just promise you, you're not going to stay where you are. Um, I've been there and I can relate to it, and I would love to help. But for now, um, please just do what you can to talk to anybody. And yeah. Thank you so much, Rishin, and everybody on the panel. It was really impactful to hear your stories. I'm now going to hand it back to you, Greg, now. Oh, wow. I don't know. <laughs> uh, how do uh, I mean? Yeah, I, I it's I'm just, I've just been sitting here like listening to y'all, just thinking like um, you saying you're a sophomore or junior, and just thinking how uh, um, powerful it would have been for me when I was in school if if one of my peers um, had had the courage to say that they were struggling with depression or anxiety or type two bipolar um, uh, or autism, like, uh, and we could just talk about it and, um, you know, just think about the, the years of uh, struggling that uh, could have avoided if I, you know, I had seen a therapist while I was in school instead of four or five years after. Um, so 
uh, I don't, I don't think y'all will ever fully understand the impact, um, uh, of your courage and sharing this here. Um, and, and just also too, for the folks who are watching, um, I know that when I first started speaking about this stuff, there's like this voice in your head that says like, what are you doing? Like, don't do this. Like, be quiet. Like, like the people will, will shun you. Um, but I just, I just want to say like, it's, it's not um, a demonstration of, of weakness to say something's wrong with you. It's, it's like all these folks who just shared their stories, they're courageous. Like they're, they're strong. Uh, like it was a demonstration of strength that they, they had the courage to share this. And, and the same goes for anyone else who's struggling. Um, it, 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 like, it is so powerful for you to be able to just share what's going on with your life with, you don't have to do it on a stream, um, you know, just to do it with someone, but uh, it really does have a huge impact. So. I think we're coming up on time. I'm, I'm not sure that we ended up having time for questions, but I, I really uh, can't thank y'all uh, enough for having the, the courage to share. And, and it just, it means a ton to me um, to j just see like kind of the, the chain reaction that happens when, when one person's vulnerable and how that can trickle down and, and affect people that you'll, you never even knew of. And so it's really meaningful for me. So thank you all so much for, for sharing. Thank you so much, Greg, and everybody on the panel. It was really powerful to hear your stories, and this is such an important conversation to have. In the chat, you'll be able to find the link to some resources, and we would love to continue to have this conversation in the Watch Party channel of the Hack This Discord. Thank you so much for everybody who listened, and please make sure if you're still here to fill out the attendance form in the chat. Thank you all so much.